be discussing in this course about the newer assessment imaging and managing strategies. So we all know that cerebral visual impairment is deficiency in the function of vision. Something is wrong with the visual pathways or the processing centers in the brain. And so eye works fine, but the brain does not understand or interpret what the eye sees. So this is what we'll be discussing in this whole course. It is becoming important because it is emerging as one of the commonest cause of visual impairment among children in our country. And also because of multiple dissoci disabilities associated with CVI, they make assessment and management of children a specialized and challenging field. So if in the last, from 2014 till now, say, say around 10 years, we have seen more than 1,000 children. So it is becoming one of the commonest cause of visual impairment. So we need to identify and manage these children. So discussion topics today will be etiology and pathogenesis of CVI, Dr. Asmita Ray. Uh, ophthalmic manifestations and assessments in CVI, correlation of higher visual deficits with MRI imaging, management of strabismus in CVI children, and then last, uh, we'll have the low vision and early intervention and management in children with CVI, Dr. Roli. So uh, we need a team for the child with cerebral visual impairment. We cannot do it without a team. We need parents, most importantly, cooperating. Otherwise, no, uh, nothing works a pediatric neurologist, pediatric ophthalmologist, low vision and a neurooptometrist, an early intervention specialist, occupational therapist, special educator. And so when all of us work together, then only we can get success. So we have our first speaker, Dr. Asmita Ray, who's currently senior consultant, pediatric ophthalmology and strabismus at Susrut Eye Foundation and Research Center, Kolkata. Our second speaker, will, um, we have Dr. Sujata Guha, who is the medical director uh, of the Department of Pediatric Ophthalmology and Strabismus, uh, Shankar Netraya, Kolkata. Sovita Rath, who is a pediatric ophthalmology consultant, strabismus uh, consultant and neuro-ophthalmology consultant at Dr. Shroff Charity Eye Hospital. Doc Major Dr. Kura uh, Roli Kurana, she is currently working as assistant professor at 158 Base Hospital, Bagdodra in our AFMC. So, and uh, last, uh, me, who, who will, who will uh, be the chief instructor of this course. Over to you, Dr. Asmita. Thank you, Suma, ma'am, for making me part of this IC. So, I'll be talking on etiology and pathogenesis of cerebral visual impairment in children. Cerebral visual impairment is defined as a complex form of vision loss resulting from damage to the retrochiasmal visual pathways, which includes the optic radiation and visual cortex, and pathways serving higher visual functions. It may be isolated or may accompany anterior visual pathway dysfunction. In some cases, this is compounded by a disordered eye movement control. Now coming to the epidemiology, it is one of the leading causes of visual impairment due to increased survival of preterm babies and better neonatal care, successful management of childhood causes of blindness due to congenital cataract and retinopathy of prematurity and increased survival of children with brain injury has resulted in rise in such cases. Now coming to the main topic, etiology of CVI. Broadly can be classified as perinatal causes, which includes hypoxic ischemic encephalopathy in preterm neonates or PVL, periventricular leukomalacia. It occurs due to vulnerability of the immature brain blood vessels in the watershed zones, which is the germinal matrix adjacent to the ventricles and in close proximity to the optic radiations. It leads to low blood flow, focal tissue death and injury to the immature glial brain cells and additional inflammation. So this is an MRI scan show of a child showing cerebral visual impairment where there is expansion of the lateral ventricles and periventricular leukomalacia. Next is hypoxic ischemic encephalopathy in term infants, which happens due to brain injury following cord prolapse or asphyxia. It occurs in the areas of distribution of basically the cerebral arteries and their watershed zones. Germinal matrix regresses by 32 weeks. So here periventricular white matter is spared. Prognosis is better in such cases. Also involvement of the basal ganglia and hippocampus following birth asphyxia have been seen in some patients. This is a MRI scan showing a posterior cerebral artery infarct involving the occipital area. Next is traumatic brain injury in children. Why is it common in children? Because they have flexible skulls, relatively less CSF volume, and reduced distance between the cortex and cranium. It occurs due to transient ischemia or edema due to the shearing of nerve axons. The next is hydrocephalus. We all know it. their expansion of the lateral ventricle happens. Herniation of the brain tissues to the tentorial orifice, compromising the blood flow of posterior cerebral arteries, and thereby it causes bilateral occipital infarction and vision loss. 
Infections of the central nervous system also contribute to CVI. Combined meningitis and encephalitis is the commonest cause. In utero infections like CMV, toxoplasmosis, rubella and herpes also contribute to it. And bacterial meningitis always has poorer prognosis than the viral one. Neonatal hypoglycemia and other metabolic disorders have also been seen to be associated with CVI. Severe hypoglycemia causes CVI due to injury to the visual or posterior parietal cortex. Mitochondrial, lysosomal and paroxysmal disorders also causes visual impairment. Uncontrolled seizure disorder. We all know that CVI is very common in children with infantile spasm, especially in hypsarthmic electroencephalograms. Another interesting uh, point is twin pregnancy, especially in twin-twin transfusion syndrome. Here the larger baby most of the time is seen to have been affected by CVI. Why does it happen? Because the larger twin adversely is affected due to expanded blood volume and results in vascular stress. Also certain cranial nerve system developmental defects like lesencephaly, holoprosencephaly and sesencephaly have been seen to be associated with CVI. And like all other things, maternal intake of drugs during pregnancy also results in CVI. Methadion, opium, benzodiazepines, cocaine and alcohol adversely affect the visual system causing infarction of key neurological structures. And lastly, acquired causes in late childhood like respiratory arrest, head injury, cardiac surgery complications and cardiac arrest. This leads to uh, brain blood vessel damage which ultimately can cause CVI. However, in some cases these are seen to be transient. Now, what is exactly CVI? What happens in CVI? Pathogenesis of CVI is related to disorders of higher visual functions. In presence of normal ocular examination, the higher visual function consists of two distinct but interacting pathways. Now, what are these? One is the perceptual pathway or ventral stream and the other is the action pathway or the dorsal stream. Now, what is this ventral stream and dorsal stream? Ventral stream basically connects the occipital cortex to the inferior temporal cortex. It stands for the visual library or what pathway of the brain. Prior memories of objects and people are stored and coordinated here. The dorsal stream, it connects the occipital, parietal, frontal and motor cortex. It stands for the visual map or visual space or where pathway of the brain. It helps to coordinate hand-eye movements on looking at a target object. So if you grossly see this picture, here, this is the dorsal stream which connects the occipital lobe to the parietal lobe which goes to the frontal lobe and motor cortex. This comprises the dorsal visual stream which stands for the wear pathway like the visual mapping system and the ventral pathway consists of the occipital lobe and the temporal lobe or the what pathway. This is where the memories are stored. The dorsal stream is the most integrating part. Why so? Because the visual scene is first processed in the occipital cortex then the dorsal stream conveys this data set to the posterior parietal cortex where the scene is processed. Once the scene is selected, information is passed to the frontal lobe, which instructs head and eyes to look at an object scene. And lastly, coordinates of objects are passed to the motor cortex, which brings about coordinated hand-eye movements to reach the object. So it's a very complex system brought about so beautifully in our brain. So this is a tree of vision. We can see where the visual scene from both the eyes passes via the retina optic nerves, optic tracts, via the lateral geniculate body optic radiations, passes on to the occipital lobe from where it relates to the temporal and the parietal, posterior parietal lobes, where we can see a complex yet such unique and defined system by which we see an object and we respond to it. Now what happens when this system goes haywire? This is where CVI happens. So this is ventral stream dysfunction and dorsal stream dysfunction. What happens? As the ventral stream stands for the memory of the brain, we first notice this presopognosia or impaired face recognition. There is topographic agnosia or difficult route finding or navigation. And there is impaired recognition of objects, shapes, and letters. The dorsal stream function is more related with the visual mapping, so we get optic ataxia or impaired visual guidance, limited capacity for simultaneous viewing of multiple objects at once, and lack of visual perception and coordination. So these are some of the common things we see in dorsal stream dysfunction. There is inability to find toys from a toy box. A child gets confused from where to pick which toy. Then difficulty in judging depth. You can see the child is lifting the legs way beyond up. Then there is difficulty in grasping and judging distance of objects from the body. This is very common we see in CVI children, the difficulty in climbing stairs, because in most cases we see that there is an inferior field defect which results in this. 
then there is difficulty in seeing very small prints or images. And as the ventral stream dysfunction is more related with memory, so it results in integrative agnosia of faces, places, objects, and shapes. Thus, to conclude, we can say that cerebral visual impairment is obvious when there is a profound problem in vision, but is more difficult to detect when visual equity is relatively normal. Thus, proper knowledge or awareness regarding etiology and pathogenesis of cerebral visual impairment can help us in early detection of the condition using accurate diagnostic tools like MRI, electrophysiological test, etc., and thereby help in early intervention and rehabilitation of such special children. Thank you. Excellent presentation. Uh, I think we all see such children in OPD and uh, it is important for us to, uh, you know, diagnose them early. Because we have, what we have find is that most of the time we are saying, okay, the vision is 6-12, we keep on uh, working up ophthalmologically and we are not seeing, finding out what is the functional vision deficits the child has. So it is very, very crucial for us to detect them early and treat. So now at Dr. Sovitarath will be telling us how to detect them early the ophthalmic manifestations and uh, and assessments. Uh. Good morning, everybody. At the outset, thank you, ma'am, for giving me this opportunity. So after such a beautiful presentation, knowing about what and where, now let's see what are the ophthalmic manifestations and assessment in children with CVI. By now we know it is a true visual impairment, which includes both cortical and subcortical level of brain. And, but why is it important to know the features of CVI? Because these visual malfunctions can be easily overcome by simple environmental measures and can help the child to be a part of mainstream and help to perform academically and socially well. So in the next few slides, I would be taking through some red flags of how to assess a CVI child as he presents to our OPD. CVI, the functional behavioral deficits, a few pointers towards it, and to evaluate as an ophthalmologist the tools what we need at our end, and to reiterate how is CVI different from OVI, which is ocular visual impairment. So at birth, if a child comes to us and by two months, if there has been no eye contact, doesn't make unstable eye contact, that should cause an alarming thing in us. Apart from that, by three to four months, if there's no social smile or no awareness of hands, doesn't want to explore his or her own hand without that, there must be that these are few features by within three to four months, which must be known that the child is developed having a small de a mild developmental issues by three months. Now by five months, if there is squinting or by six to seven months, the child is not reaching out for any object, not recognizing faces, not even familiar faces, not even the caretaker or mother's face that means that these child will are on the course of a developmental delay by one and a half years if the child cannot put small objects in a container does not point finger when named or does not respond to mother's gestures that means these child are again need to be evaluated thoroughly and also the parents need to be educated by two years if they cannot scribble does not do not walk steadily or do not understand simple commands and by three years if they have trouble climbing up down and down from steps as discussed or does not communicate meaningfully continuous drooling or even cannot eat without help these are a couple of signs which each of us must know when we see a child presenting to our OPD to assess whether the developmental course is normal or leading to a delay now we have seen that as the child has presented, those are the milestones which were affected. However, we just saw that there is a dorsal and ventral stream which is affected. So what has been discussed are there are 16 areas of visual behavior affected in these children. A child may have subnormal vision, may have normal vision, but still would have some of these problems one or the other specific to each child which we must assess and know that what is specific to each child so that accordingly measures are given. Now coming to visual attention, they would have poor fixation, they would have difficulty in shifting gazes, hence bumping into objects. Visual recognition, it would be difficult for them to identify faces, to recognize people they, or even 
objects they may be seeing but they will not be able to comprehend what they are seeing what the object is there in their hand impact of clutter is huge as discussed they will not perform well when the background is cluttered they need a clean environment with less number of objects and that that is how they will not see they will not perceive multiple objects in one uh, scene so cause ca causing simultaneousia if there are multiple objects they will think that it is only one image visual field abilities they would have both peripheral and central field difficulties which would impair their visuo motor coordination mostly it is known that that is inferior field which is affected however children would only prefer right gaze or only prefer left gaze also and that would be their gaze of uh, preference and they would pr pr try to look into that side also now color they would always prefer solid colors no patterns or no clumsy thing form accessibility is there where they cannot identify the exact form of different objects given a cup is given to them they will identify their own cup but a similar cup given to them they will not identify their borders they would have their own coding strategies to identify the objects visual guidance of upper limbs and lower limbs as our hand eye coordination or walking or crawling to take an object access to people as i discussed is the familiarity with the faces impact of light this is a dual mechanism now some of the cvi children would just light gaze and watch towards light liking light so much so that they want their rooms to be brightened up or shiny whereas others would have photophobia which will induce in them a visual fatigue that they would prefer room remaining in darker rooms and will not want to go out on a sunny day response interval is latency or reaction time given a uh, sub uh, rea uh, an uh, situation they would take time to react to that situation however if they know that it is a familiar one or it is object of their choice their reaction time will be quite short impact of motion this is again something which is dual some people some cvi children would prefer moving objects and some would only want to look up at a static scenario sensory integration their performance is affected by vibration by touch all of these things where they always want to be like isolated and would want to run away from crowded scenes visual curiosity they have decreased nature for exploring things and coming to appearance of eyes and movement of eyes is strabismus nystagmus gaze palsy as we discussed saccadic palsy which will be very common in these children but now we should be knowing all of these because we are wanting to evaluate these children in a normal scenario so what dutton says is society chooses to present information in a way that majority of the people can see clearly by ensuring that it fails within these normal limitations now it, this is someone who is a teacher in visual impairment mark chesen who says individuals with cvi actually spend their day in a world which is designed for someone else and hence we should know that each of these functions are very very important in each cvi child which we would be seeing now but how is it done functional assessment do we know how to quantify this a quantification is necessary for all these children so to choose our measure and see how they improve subsequently roman lanzi has described this as a parameter called cvi range which has scores from 1 to 10 which focuses on these 10 things that color preference need for movement visual latency visual field preferences difficulty with visual complexity need for light with distance viewing or atypical visual reflexes and visual novelty and ab absence of visually guided reach out of those 16 these are the 10 major parameters which is being focused and these are some screenshots of the cvi range questionnaire which is taken by either by observing not either it is by observing the child also by interviewing regarding the child's behavior and taking observe and also through a direct contact with the child that is assessing the child in your clinic as it comes now r is something where it represents a resolved visual behavior whereas plus describes the current functioning of the child at what status is partially describes student the child is plus minus where and if it is not applicable it is minus the score ranges from 1 to 10 and there are different questions which we can assess both before Before your measure is initiated and after your measure is initiated. Now, coming on to what are the ocular manifestations as the child comes, we know that there is a visual impairment. Parents will bring them. The child is not looking to our faces, but there is always a need for light. The child would only be doing light gazing, attracted to bright primary sources, or would have a non-purposeful gaze when looking at even interesting targets. 
So apart from visual impairment, these children may have white reflex, deviation of no eyeballs, shaking of eyes. So here we come that there is CVI and OVI which is interlapsed but still the CVI has to be taken care of because despite treating the OVI or the ocular visual impairment, children will not perform better. So as we begin to evaluate them, what we need is good fixation targets. First, after seeing the child, one can assess that what is the visual sphere of the child till what distance or within the room does he prefers and then we should choose targets which would be like puppet faces because a child begins to see the mother's face and mother's face would have discrete features so a puppet faces is a very good target to assess child in the opd third one should wear dark or a uh, solid shade of apron or even remove your apron to in stop the fear and the room should be clutter free assessment of visual acuity can be done using charts like Lea Paddles, Teller Acuity, Cardiff which are preferential based or OK in dumb in very poorly responsive children can just elicit a nystagmus and tell us about the visual prognosis. Sweep VEP is very useful because Sweep VEP performs within a span of 10 seconds and multiple readings are taken and we know these children have a short attention span. Coming on to assessment of visual acuity, these are for your videos which shows how a Lea Paddle is used which has one diffuse background and one stripe background now the width of the strip stripes increases as you see the child focusing on the wider ones then you can increase take another slide which would have or a paddle which would have a smaller width this can be done both binocularly and then also monocularly. The age of the child in months equals to expected grating acuity in cycles per degree. The quantification is again given on these Lea paddles behind them. Refraction is very essential to do a static retinoscopy as in any child. A cycloplegic refraction where homotropin is the uh, uh, cycloplegic agent for choice and a near retinoscopy is also done because most of them would also have accommodation issues. RAF ruler can be used in older children, a dynamic retinoscopy and MEM can be done to know that how much is the accommodation lead or lag in these children. Also in OPDs we could have glasses made of plus 3 and plus 5 or plus 4 to see whether their visual uh, performance significantly improves after putting on these glasses so that we know that they prefer the near dominant sphere. Now what is known in literature is in preterms myopia and its association is uh, uh, myopia is common with its association in uh, ROP but children who have escaped PVL who are born after 28 days, 28 weeks hypermetropia is more common children with cerebral palsy also have hypermetropia and all of those children would have some amount of accommodation insufficiency. This was a study published from this say our institute where we found that simple myopic astigmatism and compound myopic astigmatism are the most common refractive errors noted in Indian children. Coming on to field defects, they would have lower visual field impairment, tripping over things on the floor and difficulty walking downstairs. Visual field preferences would be there. They would have inferior field defects mainly because of superior periventricular damage and also some of them would have right homonymous hemianopia. For assessing this, older children, we can do uh, Humphrey or a confrontation testing can be done in any child even if they are smaller. I will show you in the next video. And for your... Uh, so a puppet facies again can be used or a small toy with a cardboard as a partition between and binocularly seeing where the child is fixing as you are moving the toy. Otherwise the toy can also be first this the initial part is like explaining the procedure to this child and then making the child do it himself and choose watching for which is the gaze which the child prefers. Lea wand is another modality which is available which has an illumination at the top and it's a mobile uh, wand which can be moved to any direction and move based on the gaze to which the child uh, moves the uh, uh, gay, uh, uh, field can be appreciated. Color vision. Now most of these children color vision is usually preserved. They would have very poor vision however they will identify the color of the suit you are wearing in the OPD. Children often have a favorite color and will only look at certain colors preferably red and yellow because they have longer waves lengths. Now contrast is essential in all these children because in the room it has to be 
with good contrast where, where they would appreciate the faces leah has described the gray's low, low contrast symbols the grating test and the hiding hide is another one which has been proven in literature to be equally with co positive correlation with pelly robson as we do the contrast this has contrast from 25 to 100 percent and these charts can be swapped one after the other which will also tell that either they prefer motion or they prefer static things pursuit and saccades are also affected where there can be dysmetric saccades or there can be initiation of saccadic paralysis as in seen in oculomotor apraxia coming on to strabismus they would have esotropia which is the most common type of strabismus noted exo but the characteristic pattern is the dyskinetic strabismus which changes on momentary basis or the angle variability and the shifting pattern Neuroophthalmologically, when we evaluate the fundus, children who are born less than 28 weeks have smaller discs with nerve hypoplasia. However, after 28 weeks, those who are born would have pseudoglucomatous discs. If there is a subcortical lesion, the children would prefer tonic down gaze, which can nystagmus may or may not be present. Most commonly, esotropia and large discs are seen. Now, to revise, how is CVI different from OVI? We know that OVI, if we would explain the visual behavior, whereas CVI will not, dis will not uh, describe that. In most of them, they would have prolonged latency for visual response. The attention span is poor. They have difficulty with crowded scenes, scenarios. Light gazing behavior is present and color is usually preserved. Unlike in OVI, the color may be affected based on the neuropathy or maculopathy. Now, these are two simple tests which can be done to distinguish OVI from uh, CVI. Now, these are tests which has taken into consideration so many things. That is orientation of the child, the mobility, the hand-eye coordination, the colors, and the latency. So, as we see, they, the chosen colors are discrete colors. They are good solid shapes. And the child is asked to see those shapes and fit into the exact boss boxes in the above one, which is a Lia puzzle. Whereas in the Lia mailbox, the child it will give us give us a reflection of the perception of the child, how the child is first orienting the uh, postcard before he puts it into the slit. A CVI children will have difficulty in performing these. Thus, we know the CV in CVI the brain is overloaded. And what Perkins says is. Each of this child is teachable and every child has a right to meaningful and accessible education. These are some of our children of CVI who have been thoroughly uh, rehabilitated and now can paint and are also going to school. Thank you. Thank you, Sovita, for an excellent presentation. Any questions before we start the next uh, session? Uh, next. Uh, so I know assessing CVI children is the most difficult. So any questions like um, what do we need is basically we need a LIA paddle chart in the OPD. So that could be used to assess the vision. And the children who have no eye contact or in CVI range 1 or 2 where the child does not focus on anything. So we write, we do measure the CVI range. So we have a early intervention specialist who measures the CVI range and how she explained the CVI range to measure and then she will do start doing the early intervention exercises. So when it is zero, so when the child presents with one or two means the child has no eye contact, not able to reach out to objects, not having any eye tracking or scanning, those children we will require to measure the CVI range and then it is a work of the early intervention specialist. When the child starts tracking, scanning and then we find that the child is able to see, then we can measure it with the Leah pedals or we can go ahead with the tack. And uh, it's important to measure the contrast. So what I would advise that whenever we are going for, because m what we found in our study that 31% of our preterm children had CVI. So maybe we could give a referral card. So whenever we are going, most of us go for the ROP screening. So maybe you can tell the parents that if these are the red flags and if the child is not, say after two months or three months, not able to, f uh, not able, there's no eye contact or not able to uh, focus on any object, I think they should be referred to a pediatric ophthalmologist so that we can intervene early. Because uh, when you intervene early, what I've seen is that a CVI range of one and two can easily become eight within three or four months if we intervene before the age of six months. So they really improve. So, but the thing is that uh, they have to come to you. So, uh, this is awareness I think we all have to do and we need to create so that because we can treat them early. So, very nicely she has documented all and I don't think we need a lot of money or uh, thing to invest for this. I mean, time, yes. Uh, for the <laughs> yeah. So, we could train an optometrist, see, because uh, uh, who is really interested 
and uh, time because yeah be, because they do take a lot of time to even do that simple test of uh, lia mailbox and lia puzzle it takes time so we could have optometrist one optometrist trained for this a new uh, not, not necessarily to be a neuro optometrist it can be an, uh, a normal optometrist who can do and of course we also need to do a lot of uh, because because we have to spend time on refraction we need to have an optometrist who specialized in doing mem so basically uh, we need a good optometrist who knows all these techniques and then we can intervene so uh, glasses also is important how we give them glasses so uh, so any more so yes time is a factor but yes uh, we need to help these children because sometimes we need that that is a very important question because sometimes when even when we send to the early intervention specialist ki because they need to assess the latency how much it is improved like whether now they're looking at the particular object and whether like you no know, now they can see it very soon or they take a lot of time to see it so that latency is also covered in the cvi range so in attention and latency is covered like how to uh, look at an object so they will make the patient wait so it's a one hour appointment with the early intervention specialist so because every we take give a one hour and so if there is an attention then we keep repeating the test till we get a proper test now strabismus assessment we'll discuss later because that is when we have coming to that that's more difficult but what sobita has presented is visual uh, vision assessment so vision assessment only after they have started tracking and scanning and their attention has improved you you find that like by lunio ocularly assessing by lia pedal is practically impossible uh, in these children so it is not possible at all so you are assessing their refraction and seeing whether there is anything in amblyogenic in both eyes so then you can advise patching or you are seeing if there's any squint and that's how you are advising patching for treatment for amblyopia otherwise vision assessment lunio ocularly is very is very tough binocularly yes they are cooperative but we need to as dr sumita was saying we need time for assessing these children so the next speaker um, i think i've already introduced dr sujata she is the director and head of uh, pediatric ophthalmology and strabismus at shankranetra le kolkata it's always wonderful to hear her i think she teaches a lot i have also learned so many things from her when in my younger days they were my uh, mentors you can say dr sumita and dr sujata i used to learn so much from them in strabismus whenever i used to hear their lectures <laughs> thank you dr suma and thank you for inviting me to this very relevant um, and very apt um, uh, instruction course in these this day and age so i will be dealing with the uh, higher visual function deficit in cvi and its correlation with mri now mri is something which all of us are not very familiar with and uh, let me see how to make it a little easy for all of you in the next few minutes i will be telling you when to do mri what to look for in mri the common pathologies that can be seen and um, how uh, what children will you can expect what in mri so um, let me start with a little revision of what you have heard we have OVI on one side and we have CVI OVI is ocular visual impairment where you have damage to structures from the eye to the visual pathway till LGB and usually the vision in the traditional sense that is equity contrast color is affected in OVI and we have on the other side CVI or the cerebral visual impairment which results from damage to retrogenicalate pathway and here the visual equity could be perfectly normal but the the patient may have abnormal visually guided behaviors or higher vision function deficit so as dr asmita has pointed out we have two cerebral networks which deal with the higher visual processing one is the dorsal network which deals with the where it is the occipito parietal network and it deals with the spatial processing and we have the ventral network which is the occipito temporal network which is the what processing that is the objects and its uh, shape and size 
Now again, this is a revision. We have seen lots of causes of CVI, but the most common causes are hypoxic ischemic insult, neonatal hypoglycemia and Schizers. Now let me give us brief, I know uh, Dr. Sovita has covered it in large details. Briefly, what are abnormal visually guided behavior or higher visual function deficit? These are, these can be visual field preference, latency, attraction towards movements or absence of visually guided reach, light gazing and some, uh, and uh, we might have color preference like a red preference and sometimes difficulty in a complex visual scene uh, that is called simultagnosia. So now coming to the higher visual function deficit depends on the timing of insult, location of damage and degree of insult and all three of which can be beautifully studied in MRI. So whom should we order MRI? Any child like you saw with history of predisposing risk factors or a child who has a stormy postnatal course with a poor Apgar score or a normal child with a normal perinatal history but showing neuroregression. These are the candidates where you will order MRI. What MRI sequence will you order? It is a MRI brain without contrast is good enough. Conventional T1, T2 weighted images diagnostically are most useful from second week of insult onwards and they show abnormal hyper intense signal on both T1 and T2 weighted images. Diffusion weighted images diagnostically are most useful in the very acute phase within the first week of the insult and they show diffusion restriction. So which areas to focus? Like we discussed, it is the retrogeniculate pathway which causes higher visual function deficit. So you should focus on the, uh, the retrogeniculate pathway which includes optic radiation, the parietal cortex, the trigones of the lateral ventricle, the occipital cortex, the thalamus and the inferotemporal cortex. Some of the common findings which you can expect in MRI includes the commonest finding is periventricular leukomalacia. They can also have cerebral dysgenesis, parieto occipital or sag uh, and parasagittal infarction, occipital lobe infarction and diffuse cerebral atrophy. Uh, let me illustrate uh, with, a, uh, with one of our uh, patient who came to us at age 7 months with the parents complaining the child is not fixing or following toys or light and has wandering eye movements with absence of neck holding. He was born full term but the child has a history of prolonged episodes of convulsion immediately post birth. His anterior and posterior segment was within normal limits and his MRI showed cystic lesions in bilateral parieto occipital cortex, cystic changes in the trigones and occipital horn of the lateral ventricle and hyper intense signal in the occipital lobe. This child underwent early intervention and vision stimulation and currently he can track objects, reach out objects, hold objects and walk without support. So as Dr. Suma mentioned, early intervention can tremendously improve these, these children's performance. So how does time of injury influence MRI finding? In preterm neonatal brain, the injury is mainly periventricular because the blood supply is from periphery to center, it's a border zone and this is the area which gets affected if there is a compromise in the blood supply. However, in injury to postnatal or term neonatal brain, the injury is more peripheral because of the, again the blood supply here, now it's a watershed zone with the periphery, uh, with the central blood vessel and the peripheral blood vessel merging here and injury in term infants involves parasagittal watershed cortex and subcortical white matter. So any insult during the first trimester will cause tissue liquefaction, necrosis and resorption but they will heal without gliosis. So cerebral dysgenesis is seen on MRI 
in an insult which is occurring in the first trimester you can get listen carefully where there is smooth brain um, and absence of gyri or you can get polymicrogyria where there is increased number and reduced size of gyri or you can have listen carefully where there are abnormal clefts in the cerebral um, hemispheres now insult in the later part that is in the second and uh, third trimester or in preterm uh, children uh, uh, causes repair with gliosis of the subcortical white matter and they lead to classical lesion of the periventricular area or periventricular leukomalacia so periventricular white matter is the most commonly affected in preterm babies and you can find hyper intense signal in the periventricular white matter with dilated and irregular ventricles you can also have cortical lesions uh, which can affect the optic radiation especially the superior part of the optic radi radiation which can have inferior visual field defects which can lead to the difficulty in climbing up and down stairs as you have seen the corticospinal tracts also lie very close to this area and the children can get cerebral palsy if this is also affected so periventricular leukomalacia follows a very characteristic pattern of evolution they undergo necrosis cavitations cyst formation and then the cyst collapse and results in gliosis so pvl lesions seen on mri could be cystic lesions could be dilated ventricles with irregular wavy outlines could be redu reduced volume of periventricular white matter or they could have increased signal intensity thinning of corpus callosum and lesions of the thalamus in term infants you have injury or insult to the watershed zone between the mca and the pca territory and death of cells can lead to ischemia in the watershed area leading to reduced white matter volume or they can have infarcts in the bilateral occipital lobe which can uh, affect color and contrast vision and their field of vision they can also have uh, infarcts in the parietal lobe which we have already seen uh, seen uh, affects the wear stream or they can have a diffuse cerebral atrophy so let us come to what the literature is saying we have uh, 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 a little old literature by ugetti et al who reviewed uh, 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 and compared mri of 27 preterm children affected by cp and the degree of visual acuity deficit 63 of their percent of their patient had cvi the pvl changes in the path of the optic radiation and calcarine cortex were more uh, uh, led to most severe in cases so he concluded that mri findings should not merely confirm the diagnosis but you should give spe specific consideration to the geniculo calcarine tract and the pyramidal pathways um sioni uh, uh, et al also uh, reported mri scans uh, uh, relay correlating with uh, cvi in patients with neonatal encephalopathy and they found that pvl damage uh, um, uh, um, pvl changes with damage to the optic radiation is spelled poor prognosis we reviewed 20 children uh, uh, the files of 20 children less than 10 years with diagnosis of cvi and in our uh, uh, group we found 70% had more than one etiological risk factors with birth asphyxia being the commonest and uh, we found that the dorsal stream involvement were more common in our uh, uh, in our group than the ventral stream and it correlated well with the corresponding visual fields some of the newer advances include the high angular resolution diffusion imaging the hardy which uh, can uh, uh, image the functional uh, uh, functionality of the brain and here you can see a distinct reduction in the structure in the geniculostriate projections and it helps providing neuroanatomical basis for vision deficits in cvi so to summarize we need to be vigilant in history taking we need to be meticulous in patient assessment giving time request for specific areas of mri scan correlate the scan with the vision function m uh, uh, with the visual function impairment and guide the rehabilitation accordingly thank you
excellent presentation i told you know she is a very good teacher <laughs> excellent <laughs> i've learned she explains things so beautifully and i means like this is what i've seen for how many years now 20 years i've watched her present and always i have learned something from her presentation she explain i remember the first remember the adjustable suture of her presentation dr sumita bai she used to take the rope separately a rope and she used to show us how to tie the knot in that so in fact that's how i had seen her presentation for the first time with an adjust how how to do an adjustable and uh, she had presented it so well thank you dr uh, sumita uh, yeah you. excellent so i think uh, what what we found also in our study was that hypoglycemia and um, um, i think haroli did a very nice study with us and uh, she found out that uh, hypoglycemia and hypoxia were the main common factors for uh, as etiology and uh, very nicely demonstrated all the mris like we also want to know which like uh, in which condition you know where the maximally the children are affected you know because occipital lobe yes the uh, the vision is mainly the impairment but we found out that uh, when if parieto occipital lobe is affected then it is a really a problem because the children also have cp along with that and then your coordination becomes a problem like uh, eye hand coordination and then you are struggling because the child cannot write and you are doing the exercises for the vision also and uh, the child has motor and uh, issues and also children with a lot of sensory issues i think the agenesis of corpus callosum was another which i found that was not very good prognosis um, the other periventricular leukomalacia depend it depended on how much it was affected yeah it was much much um, uh, we could manage the other problem is when we have children with epilepsy uh, like when they have epilepsy you have treated and then they get an epileptic episode and then they go back uh, to what you have improved the child to so these are few of the children like we found like um, epilepsy especially like was a real deterrent and especially for treating it also further like uh, if you have a squint then it's a problem like you they won't take up anesthesia and that's the reason so um, now the next talk is on strabismus i don't think anything different is there uh, for strabismus like um, everybody asked what is so unusual about cvi with strabismus what is there to talk about uh, basically yes uh, the main problem is assessments so uh, when to do it It's like so i mean of course there is no um, i can't teach you a faster method of we just have to keep on measuring three four times and when you can get a proper assessment then we have to plan the surgery but there is definitely an improvement uh, after surgery so we should aim at surgery um so like this uh, like this child when it comes to you and you few feel that the child is a wandering movement we can't operate this child for saying that there is an uh, there is a uh, strabismus so we'll have to wait we have to improve the cvi range we'll have to improve uh, the fixation and then only we can go ahead for surgery so this is a child who came to us when he's 5 years of age and we had poor vision squinting both eyes maintaining a head posture he was being called clumsy in school slow learner and that is how you feel bad that should i have intervened should we have intervened early should he have been referred early he was a child uh, the preterm child and did not cry at birth was in iku for 10 days there was a history there was a mri done uh, there was a history of perinatal hypoxia and it was referred and still the child was told that no treatment was advised so at 3 years he fell down the steps because of poor coordination he suffered then from right hemiplegia and facial palsy so i don't know if we i would have also operated the child at 2 or 3 years maybe if the child would have come but yes early intervention could have been started we could have started occupational therapy and the child could have been better and now of course it was very easy at 6 years to plan the squint strabismus surgery because the child is like any other child uh he could read uh, her vision was 624 so but he had problems of hemiplegia and um, i do not know if we could have averted it so similarly we find so many children in the opd which we get who were preterm uh, who had cvi and when you take the birth history you find that oh god this is a squint but actually this was a cvi child so for there was no there's no difference in the treatment later on you are going to do the normal squint surgery like uh, recess resect and if there's a dvd associated you operate oh this is really ulta means i ensured it was straight but again it is so this is a child who came into the opd recently and um, you 
रोटेट हो सकता है क्या सो अगेन द चाइल्ड वॉज इट सी वी आई हैड एन इन्फेंट हैड एन इजोट्रोपिया विद वेरी पुअर फिक्सेशन वी कुड नॉट गेट द विजन बट द चाइल्ड वॉज वी कुड द चाइल्ड वॉज कॉपरेटिव ऑन एम के टी एंड वी कुड फाइंड दैट देर वॉज एन ईजोट्रोपिया वी कुड मेजर इट एज ईजोट्रोपिया ऑफ थर्टी प्रिजम्स एंड देर वॉज एन इन्फीरियर ओब्लिक ओवर एक्शन विद डी वी डी सो वी आर प्लानिंग सर्जरी बिकॉज दिस चाइल्ड विल इम्प्रूव द चाइल्ड इज नॉट एबल टू वॉक प्रॉपरली ही स्टम्बल्स सो वी कैन प्लान सर्जरी बट ऑफकोर्स यू वुड मेजर थ्री फोर टाइम्स द अदर चाइल्ड इज ये वीडियो ये सब उल्टा पुलटा एंड चेकट इट ऑल्सो so uh, this child has tobita mentioned that there was a gaze paresis so the child is not is only preferring to gaze in the uh, there was a right gaze and not looking at all to the left now the child is uh, sleepy as she was asking me well, how will you measure in such children with inattention so you just have to wait so now this child had a full left gaze now can we call this uh, left gaze palsy we don't know basically because uh, because a child has lot of inattention but what i have seen recently when a child is older uh, means i looked up literature and giving prisms help so the we found out that after giving prisms like in a saccadic paresis or in a gaze paresis when you give prisms has your prisms and the, we found that the child started improving the mother came back after 3 4 months saying that the child has started fixating and the child is looking like in fact when next time and sovita seen this case she was wondering whether there was a saccadic paresis before that so um the it improves so maybe a trial of prisms could be given like in horizontal gaze palsy and it the child is really improved the parents felt that the prisms had helped the child so these are some of the things which we could uh intervene and we could uh, uh, you know we could help the children so the strabismus coexistent is as high as 73% and uh, this is what we found in our study which has uh, was, was done by roly here and um, the main specific traits is that there's angle variability and shifting patterns so um, this is again what studies have proven that all types of strabismus you'll see uh, mixed deviations I mean, whatever you see normal strabismus with you will see them now this is a study of course uh, roly has done mainly the data and the full uh, uh, the study the we found that the cvi with isotropia in our study we found exotropia more and uh, most of the papers were mentioning isotropia as more and we found it associated with all types same like we had an accommodative component with myopia with the stagmus and we also had uh, so important thing is don't jump to surgery observe children if it is an iso uh, like you find that there is very poor visual behavior unstable deviation please wait because i have seen many of the children resolving spontaneously in when at 30 40 prisms of iso when i see them after one year when they are stable and they have very if their visual behavior has improved we find that improving with time and i mean i feel good that i have not operated that child because otherwise i would have landed up with an consecutive exotropia so wait don't just okay we have got so repeated measurements and we need stable and constant measurement before planning surgery so now this is a simple isotropia i do uh, most of us would do the same surgery a bimedial recession i have done for this child but the important thing which i wanted to cover in this child is that we need to ensure that the child undergoes a post operative visual rehabilitation and vision therapy you may have improved the child in the motor part remember that there is still a sensory component and also these children have lot of other problem like their vision is not full they have lot of coordination problems a vision therapy is a must you need to improve their saccades so uh, the vision therapist in our institution do a lot of saccadic exercises after the surgery and that improves them much better to function especially for writing and reading and because you need you need your saccades and pursuits for the child to read and write so this is very important and also uh, helping them in their perceptual skill training there's something called as perceptual skill training nowadays which the vision therapists do where they improve their coordination so this is available and uh, that's how we can improve the child's education so um, the long term results they found with developmental delay or that there were less surgical uh, predictable surgical results so wait do constant measures and it is not so bad 
now dr uh, minakshi ma'am has done the study with comatin isotropia in patients with developmental delay and she published her results and she felt that we should under correct because we get over corrections so 16 to 20 percent means we, we they have mentioned that 30 percent under correction but i would say that we don't need to do more 30 percent under correction but we need to at least 20 percent under correction of your bimedial recession we need to do otherwise they again go into consecutive exotropia i have had children going into consecutive exotropia after uh, operating them so after 2 3 years again they go into consecutive exotropia because the sensory does not develop and then you have to go in again and do an advancement surgery so uh, and then they go really bad they have very large uh, consecutive exotropias so um, this is so our own study we pub uh, we have not published we have sent it for publication but i just wanted to share is that earlier on i was operating at a much earlier age i used to go ahead and do even less than 2 years with developmental delay and neurological impairment uh, but what uh, because we wanted okay let them get good binocular vision but what we found was that uh, that operating early did not give us major advantage in children with cvi they had uh, the, so it's better to wait let their motor stabilize and then go ahead with the surgery because many of them what i found was that no none of them developed stereopsis sensory was poor in so many like this is where we have compared our numbers are not uh, same like we did around um, our numbers were around in our uh, normal where are numbers yeah we found that we did around 17 in the children with neurological and 80 with normal children and we found that fusion was absent most of them and 90% of them so we didn't get any sensory output so good so it is better to wait rather than what we found that because we are getting consecutive xt in lot of patients because if we have operated early we found that consecutive exotropia when they improved their visual behavior then we had to go in another surgery and the parents are very reluctant then so uh, so i think the surgical management is the same as we do for other squint uh, management but mostly it is that uh, they we need to work on their perceptual skills even after surgery because they come with that and after you perform their surgery we uh, we uh, we are uh, doing a study on the dutton's questionnaire we are seeing how it improves pre and post surgery uh, we are trying to um, modify we are trying to see whether it improves their functional skills rather than uh, just doing the uh, squint surgery and we are getting good outcomes it will be published very soon and uh, sometimes we may need to do multiple surgeries so that's all i want to say that uh, we have to um, we need do not rush to them to do surgery early wait for stable measurements and improve their visual behavior and then operate thank you any questions uh, i think we coming to our last talk so any questions before that um, yeah yeah sure mic mic please and your surgical way of approach the case will differ if it is nystagmus with strabismus yes definitely than yeah. per se strabismus alone so most of yeah. them will be com combination of both yeah most of them will have nystagmus so most of them it will be like nystagmus with your with your strabismus so we'll need to see whether the Binocular face turn surgeries and addressing the face turn along with the strabismus should be done yes. rather than your success rates will be much better than rather than looking at strabismus alone in one particular eye like exotropia or esotropia they will have some face turns and there will be an exotropia or esotropia associated with it so you do a surgery for the face turn and in addition try to do the skin surgery yeah and what rate would you prescribe that was i think a 5 4 5 year old child 5 year old we actually the uh, yolk prisms we cannot give more than i mean some are saying 3 we i we have means three prisms you can give maximum um, uh, so, i mean i have given five in this child five. but you yeah five yolk huh. but uh, you were uh, just to paper that paper which i read because to go it was saying that you can give even three and you get good results there is going to be a kind of eye for the yolk one strategy could be using one eye to correct alignment and fixing eye to use for nystagmus surgery so that also works well if you are confused about what to do and with moving this eye that way how it will affect then this is one way you choose the fixing eye to correct the head posture and non fixing eye to correct the alignment separate the no 
Now Roli will be telling us when the dust settles and what next to do. Thank you so much, ma'am. Uh, very good afternoon to one and all. And thank you for giving me this opportunity to present here. Can I have the presentation, please? Yeah. OK, so my topic is early intervention and low vision management in children with cerebral visual impairment. Uh, so as we all know that early intervention alone for vision is not enough. And early visual uh, rehabilitation definitely helps in overall rehabilitation of the child. So with only visual stimulation, we can improve hand-eye coordination as well. Visual fields improvement will help in walking early and then will also help in motor improvement. Similarly, visual perception and tracking will improve uh, egocentricity. And then there will be overall development, causing improvement in social behavior and other, uh, better response to other therapies. So as we all know, CVI has already been discussed. It is an umbrella term. From an intervention point of view, we need to know what are we looking at, when did it happen, and how, do we have, how did it happen. So like ma'am uh, already mentioned, like if hypoglycemia is there, then uh, an absent cal uh, corpus callosum, uh, there are lesser chances of uh, better prognosis, but still we have to work hard and we can uh, get there. So as already been mentioned by Dr. Sovita and ma'am, that uh, we have to first classify and from an intervention point of view, once we have classified into the ranges, uh, whether it is phase one, phase two, and phase three, accordingly we chart after the evaluation, whether uh, what are the parents' uh, concerns what are the concerns that the intervention therapist is going to uh, j jot them down? And then what are the environmental modifications we can make? After having all of them, then we can decide on the adaptive uh, technology that can also be used. So broadly, phase one and two can be classified as low functioning CVI, where we need to work a little harder. Whereas phase uh, three is high functional CVI, where they usually have good vision. But here, we have to work more on the visuospatial uh, uh, things. And uh, like ma'am said that there was a child who was three years old and when they came to us, they did not know because vision was already 624. So these are the cases where we diagnose them later. We even, like I'm from the armed forces and we had a case who was there in the army and when we were doing a recruitment, where, there we realized they just had nystagmus, that to latent nystagmus. And then on retrospective evaluation, we could get a CVI diagnosis or diagnosis of PVL in that case. So we have to be a little suspicious from the beginning. First and foremost is parent education. If the parents don't understand what the child is going through, what the status is, what the visual status will be, and what is the status that is going to, what is the strategy that we're going to apply to improve that vision, uh, we can't go ahead. The parents need to be fully convinced, especially with general ophthalmologists, they would do the refraction, they would do the strabismus, or refer to a strabismologist, but they would never refer to an intervention specialist. That is important, and we need to have that awareness amongst the general ophthalmologists also. As one of uh, the audience has asked, how frequently do we need to reassess? So to frequently reassess, we have all those latency and all those things covered in the CVI range. However, when we are taking the child for assessment, these points need to be kept in mind. Uh, whether the child is fully uh, attentive or not, whether the child is fed or not, if they've eaten their food, they will definitely perform better if they have. If they are not ill, if they have slept or not, and then if there is any fatigue already there. Like ma'am had mentioned, if they're an epileptic uh, child, if they just had an epileptic seizure, you would have improvement as an intervention specialist and gradually, and suddenly they will be back to zero. So you have to start again. And this needs to be told to the parents, otherwise what they feel is that so much of intervention already done, so much therapy already done, and there's no improvement. So we have to do this. Now the CVI range should be filled at least once in every three months, and it should be discussed and re-evaluated and re-discussed. So as I said, counseling the parents is very important. We need to tell them that 50 to 80% of the brain deals with vision in some way or the other. So, and there, is, there will always be scope of improvement. So you have to give them this hope so that they can work on it. And early interventions mean as early as possible. Like ma'am said, six months, within six months if you do it, there's going to be great improvement. But two to three years is the range when you're still expecting good improvement. So ophthalmological treatment, this has already been covered, but just to cover it uh, all, we have to give them glasses, do a dynamic retinoscopy, give them uh, plus glasses if required, management of the strabismus and cataracts and nystagmus, all that has to be done prior to the therapy, but we need to continue the therapy even after. And then the, there are these newer interventions that have now come in. Uh, there is a case report saying that transcranial electrical stimulation helps 
along with the visual uh, stimulation. There is an RCT which says that acupuncture given specially on the tongue and the scalp that can really help along with the visual therapy and there have been statistically uh, significant results showing improvement. Similarly, an RCT has been done on stem cell uh, in, uh, transplantation and showing a great improvement in these children. But all of this goes along with the vision therapy. There is no replacement of that. So coming to the general principles of early intervention, the first thing is that we need to have a holistic approach. We need to understand how much the child can walk, how much the child can understand. So accordingly, we can grade where we can start, how much therapy we can give. And then we need to understand the visual world of the child. If we are giving them toys on the floor when they're sitting down on the floor and they have an inferior field defect, it is not going to help and we will just the, be frustrated with the therapy. So we have to understand their visual field, what are the contrasts they can use, what is the visual grating, what are the maximum thickness of the lines that they can differentiate. When we start therapy, we should already know all of this so that we can work on this and further refine it later. And as shown, picture, uh, shown in this picture, it is important to have a good posture for the child so that the uh, child is sitting straight with uh, patients with CP. If they're all falling down, it's very difficult to start therapy in them. And we should always try to use therapies which can be replicated at home because parents can do this therapy for whole day long. They'll be there with the uh, therapist only for an hour or so. So environmental modifications and home modifications that can be done. First and foremost, we need to declutter the house. There should be no extra toys, no extra uh, decoratives kept, no uh, wallpapers, as plain as possible. We can have curtains which can be of a darker contrast so that the child can identify doors and windows in the house. Then, as earlier it was said that when stimulating vision, only stimulate vision. But now, that's not the concept. Stimulating all the uh, senses together gets us a better improvement. So tactile stimulation by the father growing a beard, contrast improvement by the mother uh, doing some highlighting makeup, and like it, here we show there's a feeder bottle where we have uh, grated it according to the visual grating of the child so to make it more attractive, and it has a shiny component, so the child accepts it. Uh, gracefully. We should avoid too many toys, we should present one toy at a time. Coming to visual stimulation, it is a very dynamic and an interactive approach. Choice of stimulus should be as per the assessment, what is the preference of the color, the size of the uh, object that the child will react to. Reaction of the child to each stimulus should be observed, noted, and then we make further ad adjustments to further engage the child. So start with what is known, engage the child with what is known, and then move towards what is not known, what we can further refine to. Okay, coming to a multi-sensory approach, we need to give uh, all the tactile stimulus, visual stimulus, sound stimulus, as I've already discussed. What would be an optimal stimulus for the child? We should have the correct frequency, the correct intensity, the correct duration. If the child's visual attention is only for a few minutes and you're going on showing them the stimulus, it's not going to work. So give them frequent vision breaks in between. The environment should be good and uh, refrain from uh, giving visual tasks, especially when the child is hungry, tired, or ill. So here we are just showing that there are two different sizes of the stimulus and different colors according to the preference of the child and also the visual distance at which the child is going to absorb that has to be noted. Coming to movement, using movement as a tool. So movement is generally there to uh, gauge the, engage the child, to get the attention of the child. It will also improve the attention span and we have to keep it again at the correct distance. However, we should notice, that we should always note that all children with uh, dyskinetopsia their movement is actually a big problem for the child. In that case, the child and the uh, therapist and the uh, object should both, all of three, uh, the three should be absolutely still and calm for the child to work on it. Also, movement can be a distractor. So if I'm showing a, a, top, uh, a toy to the child and there are people moving in the background, it's not going to help. We need to put screens so that the child cannot see any other thing in the background. Then working on the visual uh, fields, we already know that inferior visual field is the one that is most effective because of the posterior parietal defects. So we do not use this field in the beginning. Show them what they already know and then gradually move from the non-seeing area to the seeing area. Go to the edge of the seeing and non-seeing area. Stimulate the edge as much as possible. Teach them uh, tracking movements. Once they start doing track, uh, tracking movements, their saccades and pursuits are better. Only after that you can involve the non-seeing area and get it in your visual field. We really need to keep it simple, show a solid object, a bright colored object in a dark background. Even dark gloves can be worn so that even the gloves or the uh, 
uh, instructor's hand is not a distractor and with that we can go ahead show them one object at a time and then always develop a routine do the same things every time it will develop, uh, lead to a visual memory to the child and help her using familiarities as a tool is very important so for example we have this rattle here which has gratings according to the vision of the child it has bright colors and we've been using this rattle, rattle to stimulate the vision now we can use the same rattle to bring it into their visual field so familiarity it's a favorite toy they will work on it further and it will be a faster improvement so whenever adding new information try to have a familiar background Coming to high functioning CVIs, where we already have good vision, but uh, the problems are with optic ataxia, agnosia, and dyskinetopsia, and those kind of things, where visual spatial orientation and egocentricity is a problem. So here, tactile sensation has to be used to manage the visual, uh, visual spatial difficulties. Like we see in this picture, the child knows what a nine is. The child knows where the nine has to be placed, but they have to use their hands to feel the nine and then put it there. So this is how they keep practicing this and gradually their hand-eye coordination improves. Coming to optic ataxia, they are unable to grab a simple bottle. So here what we can do is, we uh, do this Leah's mailbox and uh, first we start with this Leah's mailbox uh, technique on a 2D scale. So we put it flat on the ground, ask the child to put it on the, uh, put the card on the slit and gradually make it 3D for the improvement. Now here in this last picture, we see that this child has already overcome the crowding phenomenon and is now able to pick up all the pink uh, sticks from the box. So now here they are working on the sorting of the child. So coming to orientation and mobility, now if there is a problem in the temporal lobe, navigational skills will be affected. So here we have to teach them navigation, we have to first give them a preview. We start with very small backgrounds, just take them from one room to the other and show them all the bright things, all the good visual landmarks and the optimal sounds that can be used to recognize that path along with bright colors or tactile sensations if possible. Then gradually increase the route. Do it again and again with them. This will give them some kind of a familiarity and then describe the objects that are being used. Once the objects are described, they, it will also lead to increase in the cognition. At the end, coming to a communication support, augmentative and alternate communication and assisted technologies. Earlier it was for, uh, felt that having these assisted technologies, low vision, uh, not the low vision aids, but having these uh, iPads and uh, videos and uh, digital screens showing the uh, objects and uh, telling you about the objects, the descriptors were a no, no for these children, but now it is seen that the sound sense, the vision sense, if they all work together, it's going to bring a better improvement. So we need to integrate this. This is going to be a visual bonus for the child. Coming to the low vision, we can use all the magnifiers like we use for all other low vision aids. Now this is a special tool that has been made only for CVI children. This is an app. It is easily downloadable and uh, it is present on Apple. So here we see an object on a black background and as the child taps the object at the right place, the object grows in size and at the end it also applauds the child for doing the right thing. So it really helps in building up the this. The AAO has a list of such apps and games that we can use to uh, inculcate these activities in the child. As has already been mentioned, an integrated intervention approach is the best. Having all of them under one roof is going to be the best idea for the parents so that all the therapists can discuss amongst themselves what sensations, what sensory uh, functioning the child is already having and the others can uh, function on it accordingly. Thank you and at last I would like to thank SEH for letting me know all this information. Thank you.
Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.